Hi, everyone. Welcome to A Seat at the Table. I'm Noelle Swan. I am the science editor of the Christian Science Monitor, and I am so happy to have all of you here today to join us. We have three very accomplished women here who have climbed to the highest ranks of journalism. Christy Gonzalez, Vice President. Oh. Uh, she's the, hang on one second, my slides are all messed up. Can we restart the slideshow? Thank you. All right, starting over. Christy Gonzalez, Vice President and General Manager of Austin's ABC affiliate, KVUE. Elena Bergeron on the far end there is the Editor-in-Chief of SB Nation, Vox Media's sports blogging network. And in the middle, we have Sharon Chan, the Vice President of Innovation, Product, and Development at the Seattle Times. You have likely heard a lot about the challenges facing journalism this week. Rigorous reporting is being drowned out by fake news and media manipulators. Public trust in media is at a dangerous low. And financial models are at risk of collapse. From every angle, we're being shown that journalism has to change. The entire industry needs to adapt and to innovate. And to do that, we need fresh perspectives with bold ideas. For decades, journalism has relied on the same business models, voices, and institutions, while a vast resource of talent has been hushed and otherwise minimized. I'm talking about women and communities of color. If our industry is going to survive this current crisis, we need every voice at the table. That's why we're here today, to try and lift each other up and help everyone find their path to leadership. And before we dive in, I just want to tell you quickly a little bit about myself and each of our three panelists. So I came from a generation of women who really just shied away from the term feminist. We like to believe that society was moving past the need for that particular undercurrent. It's become pretty clear to me since then that we were very, very wrong. And I have since realized what countless underserved communities have learned again and again. And that is that progress comes in waves. They surge and they retreat, and they need constant energy to keep moving forward. I work for a publication, the Christian Science Monitor, that was founded by a woman, Mary Baker Eddy, in 1908. That was a decade before women had the right to vote in this country. 75 years later, the Monitor became the first national newspaper to appoint a woman editor-in-chief. We are very proud to have been on that leading edge, but I can tell you that 35 years after that, we still need to make an active effort to make sure that women are represented in our leadership and in our stories. Progress takes constant effort. Sitting beside me are three women who are surging forces, driving progress in journalism, not just for women and communities of color, but for the industry as a whole. Elena Bergeron started her career as an intern at ESPN Magazine, turning down a job at the Washington Post, I've heard. She spent 11 years there before leaving in 2014 to explore alternative content platforms. After launching a successful basketball blog at Complex, she took the helm of SB Nation in 2017. And if you were watching MSNBC this weekend, you might have seen her discussing Nike's continued endorsement of Colin Kaepernick on Politics Nation with Al Sharpton. Sharon Chan also started as a beat reporter covering education, politics, and technology for the Seattle Times. After a stint as the Times Associate Opinion Editor, she transitioned into management and helped to lead the paper's transformation into the digital world. One of the most inspiring things that she has done since she became VP of Product Innovation and Development was telling her male boss that it's not fun being the only woman, the only person of color, and the only person under the age of 50 at the executive level. That bold comment 
led to the promotion of another woman under 50 within a matter of months. And Christy Gonzalez got her start in TV news as an intern at New Mexico's PBS station, KNME. Since, she has worked in television markets in Philadelphia, Fresno, California, Raleigh, North Carolina, and New York City. Christy's career has been one of rapid ascension. In 2016, at the age of 35, she was hired to run KVUE in Austin. One of the things that I admire about Christy is how insistent she is about sharing credit for her current success with the women who have supported her along the way. I want to talk a little bit about that need for support. And behind every success story like these is a broad network of mentors, cheerleaders, role models, and so much more. So that's where we're going to start our questioning. I'm going to start with Christy, and I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about the role that individual mentors have played in lifting you up and getting you where you are today. Sure. In fact, my mentor story is a big reason I'm sitting here now in this chair, because at 25, I finally left Albuquerque, New Mexico after working at three different TV stations there, and I moved to Philly. Came in that station, WPVI, and I saw a woman who for the first time, she was a general manager at that station. I thought, man, she kind of reminds me of me. Maybe if she's a GM, I could be one too. And so I made that goal at 25 to become a GM, and I thought it was going to be a really bold move to make that goal by 40. And as you guys heard, it happened a lot earlier. But the reason that happened was because this woman, once I told her um, my goals, took me under her wing and mentored me and really was my career sponsor for the next 10 years. So you heard a lot of cities that I moved to. Well, one of the reasons was because as I wanted to grow my career, I had to make the sacrifices of moving all those different places, but she was there guiding me. And so her name was Rebecca Campbell. Um, and talk about a, a rapid career. This woman is now running the Disney company in Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. Uh, and she opened so many doors for me and got me ready to become a general manager. And this is what she assigned to me that I would like to also assign to you guys. As you climb, lift. Rebecca told that for me and she said, and you know what, pay attention to other women and minorities because there's not a lot of them at the top. Well, beyond those one-on-one -on -one mentoring uh, relationships, there are also these broader communities and, and peer networks. I wonder, Elena, could you talk a little bit about how those kind of networks have helped propel your career? Oh my gosh, those networks are super important, not only because I think that journalism, and in particular in digital media, the landscape has changed so much over time that really there is no playbook and there is no uh, just roadmap for how you should navigate your career. There's a lot of up, forward, sideways, backwards positions that you really have to assess and you really have to lean on your network to sort of gut check you about uh, the next move that you're gonna make, whether there's enough opportunity at the next job you're considering, whether the place you're at has you know, a glass ceiling that you can't break through. You can't know that unless you have other friends in the business and other people who look like you or maybe think like you to sort of navigate through that so you can rely on your peers to sort of make those decisions for yourself. Sharon, you've been very active in the Asian American Journalists Association. You served as president for a little while. Mm -hmm. But when you and I spoke, you, um, you stressed that it's really important for women to establish more diverse networks beyond the identity-based ones that they're already mm -hmm. a part of. Yeah. And I mean, that's something you feel like you hear men told, white men told all the time, you need to diversify your networks. Why do you feel like that's so important for women and women and people of color in general? Um, well, I mean, I think that the reason it's really important to build inclusive networks is, first of all, leadership is all about leading by example, right? So if you're expecting, like if I'm talking to my boss about the need for diversity among upper ranks, like I need to show it myself. Um, and then, and that is, and inclusive networks is a lot of things, right? It's where you show up, right? What events that you go to, what are you posting on social media, 
right? Like editors who I think, even white male editors who do a really good job of this, show up at AAJ and at NABJ and LGJ events, and you see photos of it like on their Facebook page, right? Um, so I think that's another reason it's really important to um, show, like, really show inclusion and serve as an example of that. But I also will say that it's um, really easy when you're a young woman or a young person of color coming up to um, really look to other women or people who look just like you within your organization as the people you're going to make, like, you're going to be my mentor or you're the person I'm going to go to with my challenge and my problem. And um, it can really limit you. Some of like my most important mentors have been white men. And if I just stuck with going to Asian American editors who have been incredibly important in my career, then I think I would have limited myself and I would have like reduced the amount of diversity there was in just advice that I was following. I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of young journalists of color make this mistake. Heard. I wonder if we could spend a little bit of time talking about the idea of title versus space. So I, this year I've been privileged to be a part of ONA's Women's Leadership Accelerator, and, which is a fantastic program. Any woman in the room should consider applying. But one of the principles that came up repeatedly during the uh, week that we spent in LA was this idea of title versus space. And Tran Ha, the incredible design thinking guru who helped lead the program, she told us that leadership can come from power or it can come from influence. And I found that to be just really fascinating and inspiring. This idea that leaders, they don't need an authoritative title or even direct reports to actually drive change. And really what you need is the space to try new things and to share your experiences. So, you know, looking through all of your careers, it doesn't seem like any of you necessarily started out thinking that you were on a management track. So how did you find that, um, that initial space to be able to demonstrate those leadership skills that, uh, that get you promoted to begin with, to get that title and authority? Um, I'm, you know, as you were talking about role models, I'll talk about, I, I think like thought, I think if you're in a newsroom that you can lead from anywhere. There are incredibly influential reporters, digital producers who are very young, who have outsized influence. And you actually have to like, in order to get that job of management and leadership, you basically need to act like you already have it. So that can be very difficult to do when you're young. I remember there was this one time um, we had, we used to have these quarterly newsroom meetings and we had like 300 people in the Seattle Times newsroom. And I was really angry going into it because during a Winter Olympics, um, the Seattle Times sports section had referred to, basically said like, Michelle Kwan wasn't American. Like they said like, Ameri I think the headline was American beats Kwan was the headline, and I was super mad, and I was talking to my Asian American mentors. I'm like, I'm gonna quit, I'm so angry. And I went into this uh, newsroom-wide meeting, and I basically called out the managing editor like during the Q&A session. I'm like, Why, you've alienated 12, at least 12% of our readership. What have you done to address this? How has this person been disciplined? And um, I mean, I think from a position of like being, I think I was an intern at the time, um, and I was like, <laughs> I was like, I don't care if I, I like if I never get promoted here. I'm just going to leave and work somewhere else. And what happened was the managing editor came to my desk after that, and he said, I really like that you said that. Don't lose that. And he actually became a mentor of mine after that. So I think that was a way to show leadership, like. In retrospect, I was realized like he just appreciated that I showed leadership. And perhaps I probably said something that he was feeling, but he couldn't say. I think initiative is so important. Has anyone in here ever gotten a boss to give you a job that didn't exist? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's quite the experience, right? When you're like, okay. So that initiative, you saw an opportunity and you started to do something and fill up, fill up that space, right? But even just bringing that up to your boss and getting their buy-in, that's huge. So taking the initiative, doing more, way, always do way more that's what's on your job description. I mean, that's the biggest way to show leadership is just to go into other spaces where you can be useful and your management will take notice of that in a heartbeat. Uh, and then I think my biggest lesson there too is collaboration and getting buy-in. 
So when you don't have that title, it's really important to go with your coworkers and explain why you want to do something and get them on board with you. And if that's not the right way, then give them the idea, make them seem like it's their idea, and all of a sudden you're becoming the thought leader within your organization and people are coming to you. Well, I I'd, I'd want to push back a little bit because I don't want to be naive about the idea that space is just something you can create by yourself regardless of your role because I don't think that that's necessarily true or universal, especially in newsrooms as things continue to change and there are very strict page view goals and revenue goals and everything else. I think that you have to look for space that leads to more space. And so what I mean by that is, yes, you can take ownership and you can show initiative and say, I want to cover this thing because we're not doing it right or we're not doing it well. But many times, uh, especially at the beginning of your career, you have to make the case that that coverage is valid and that it will do something to move the business line for your organization. And so I, I can think of, and only because they're sitting right in front of me, we have two journalists on staff at SB Nation, one of whom has pushed our coverage on Kaepernick, and it resulted in huge traffic shifts for us all last year because there were so many news organizations that struggled with it. Mm -hmm. And then also with WNBA coverage this summer, which seems like a no-brainer because it is a sports drought leading into summer. There's literally only MLB going on and nobody's really watching baseball. So the idea that we could create <laughs> extra engagement off platform or we could create extra page views out of these areas that we hadn't covered well in the past, that showed initiative. But it, you also have to take the initiative of saying, I did this and here was the result because mm -hmm. that's how you create more space. That's a really great point. So there can be a bit of a catch-22 when you sort of become assertive and try and take space like that, though. There's this issue that I, that I am calling, I probably didn't coin this, I probably heard it somewhere, the strong woman paradox, right? So the idea, I bet many of you in here have been called things like this, when you are trying to be more, uh, when you're trying to be creative and you're trying to do things that you really should be getting more labels that are more like this. And it's, the thing is, is projecting confidence is really hard for a lot of women, and it can be even harder when you get dismissed or rebuffed or disparaged for doing so. And so each of you, you've managed to earn the respect of entire newsrooms. So how have you come to find that voice as strong women? I can kick off because mine actually doesn't start at in a professional space. I found that voice through tough things I had been through in my personal life. Uh, and so I, you know, I didn't realize that this would be a gift to me later on in life, but because of the family I grew up in was not the easiest family. We had a lot of things going on there, including violence and addiction. Um, those things, facing them head on early on in my life and surviving them, ended up giving me the steeliness in boardrooms. I never would have thought that that would be the byproduct of that, but I go back to, for me, if I can survive that, there's no room full of people in a workplace that's scary. I've been through scary. So I, I, I do use that personal thing to draw in, and it just kind of fuels me to the point of, um, it gave me a perseverance and a grit that I don't always find in a lot of people, but it allowed me to be very confident. Um, and so I would just encourage you, if you have anything like that in your life too, to use it as your fount, and also use your diversity as a fount too to give you confidence. Because the way I see it, our voices need to be louder and people need to know what we're thinking so that the business will be stronger when they hear from us. Well, I, I look at these and those words on either side of the coin are very subjective. And maybe for better or for worse, um, the one that matters the most to me is right. And so I try to co-sign when I'm in, in the room, not based on those terms, but what, was she right though? <laughs> is my basic, biggest signifier. And we, we had the who was your mentor sort of word cloud and I put my mom on there, uh, mostly because that's her ultimate judgment mark. It's like, if you were right, then it doesn't matter. Um, but also because no matter what people think 
on either side of the coin, whether you were bossy or determined, if I was right, I don't have to worry about being liked. My mama likes me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, it's important to look at your organizations through like the lens of culture, right? So I didn't realize this when I first started, but um, I was really lucky that through the Asian American Journalists Association, I got some like culturally specific leadership training that mm -hmm. talked about what is the culture that you grew up in, right? Like Asian American culture is very much hard work gets its own reward. You let older people speak because they have all the wisdom. Younger people really shouldn't say anything if you're, you know, because you have still so much to learn. Um, and I, it's a little, I mean, I kind of, you kind of think that, but it wasn't until I went to this leadership training. Um, and that's why I'm a huge fan of culturally gender specific training like ONA's leadership um, uh, workshops as well as AHA's workshop and the, many other ones out there. Um, it wasn't until that was laid clear to me that I realized, okay, if I want to be successful in this environment that is predominantly white male majority, I'm actually going to need to change my behavior. Um, and it's still my personal choice whether I want to do that. The answer is not like, oh, you can't be true to yourself. So um, it actually did require me to practice speaking up and learning how to be comfortable with public speaking, not being nervous about it, um, really finding a way, like I, I think sometimes you sit in a room, you're like, I see a lot of people just repeating what other people are saying <laughs> and they're getting credit for that. But understanding where that's coming from and understanding uh, like your role in that and how you can bring value without just being sitting there silently. Because you are being judged for sitting there silently, and that's hard. Well, what, one of the things I'll add to that is, can you live with yourself if you sit there silently? If you got in the room and you were at the meeting, and then you leave the meeting and you didn't say anything, that's the kind of stuff that keeps me up at night. And so it's going to trump how I think I'm being viewed or whatever reticence I have about speaking up, because I literally cannot leave the meeting and go, oh, I should have said that. I, I just want to Go say ahead. one last thing. I was pitching a job, and they had asked my coworkers what they thought of me, right? And one of them said, oh, she doesn't take no for an answer. <laughs> and I know he was trying to be negative when he said that about me, but I was like, hey, that's kind of a badge. I'm proud of that. And so I, I do take some of those words, and I, straight, I strip the negativity you know, off of them. And if, if somebody calls me aggressive, I'm like, damn right, I'm aggressive. Let's get it done. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what's wrong with that? That's, we need some of that boldness. Well, I, I want to keep this conversation going, but I also want to give the audience a chance to ask questions. If you have any, there are microphones in the back of the room there. So if you have any, feel free to go line up behind there. We'll, we'll keep going a little bit longer and start calling on people as it seems that you're ready. And. So it's one thing for you to earn the respect of your staffers, but what about um, all of the other communities that you work in, right? So Sharon, at, before you were an executive, you were a member of the editorial board, mm -hmm. right? And before that, a local reporter. Mm -hmm. What was it like trying to earn the public's trust um, as a young woman, as a woman of color, just as a, as a new reporter? Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's really hard when you're young and single and female, actually. Like, and I can actually see a difference in how people treated me after I got engaged, which is really strange. I had not been expecting that, but suddenly bosses wanted to take me to lunch <laughs> because now I was committed to the company. So um, you, and then I also felt like, especially, so that's just internally. Externally, sometimes you would have these meetings and uh, interviews with, like maybe they'd be at a restaurant with a male source, and then suddenly you'd be wondering like, is this person think this is a date? Like, <laughs> I, those are kind of like things that you feel as a young single female reporter that, you know, as you get older, you realize like, oh, that was actually because of that. So I think, it's, um, I think it's good to acknowledge it, um, you know, and then think about how to, um, I think you can acknowledge it. I, I don't really know how to deal with the fact that people treat you differently after you're engaged. Um, I have a friend who's single now. She's the CFO at Redbox Outer Wall, and she's like, I get all these weird questions from my coworkers about my dating life that just seem completely inappropriate. 
Um, and you know they wouldn't ask me this if I were married, and they wouldn't ask a single man these questions. So um, you know, now if that were the case, I would just, if I were her, I would probably just ask them, would you ask a single man, your coworker, these dating questions? Um, yeah. OK. Elena, you work in a really especially male-dominated segment of journalism. What has, been that, what has that been like, really carving out a path in sports? Super interesting, <laughs> because uh, one of the weirdest things about working in sports is how much of a part of men's identity being a sports fan is, right? And so there's a lot of times when you are relaying feedback or criticism or trying to course correct, and their identity as someone who is passionate about sports is core to who they are. So the feedback is really entangled in a lot of emotional investment, which is the upside down dynamic that people tell you about as a woman in leadership positions, right? It's always women are wildly emotional and like you really have to couch your criticism around that. And it's like in a weird way uh, in sports, you have to sort of flip it a little bit for men because they feel very strongly about that passion. But coming up within sports, obviously the, the gender dynamics are very stereotypical. Um, so I can remember getting it from all ends, not only from athletes we would cover who don't think that you should be the one covering their sport because you clearly don't play on their level and you can't understand what they're thinking. It's up, I watch sports all the time every day and I can contextualize you in a way that you can't do for yourself so you should just be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> to you know, people in management positions in journalism going, well, you know, I don't know, and maybe we'll stick you on women's sports, and you know, here's, here's where your place should be, or you should commit yourself to this beat, and we don't have time for you to think outside of that box. And so there are very traditional prescribed rules, especially coming up in magazines uh, that were clearly form lanes that I was like, this is dumb, we shouldn't do it like this. I do not want to be a talking head. Like, I would rather do interesting, compelling coverage of athletes and sort of like the way they move culture. And that was a really big, weird situation for me, especially at ESPN, because ESPN, and you guys have seen it probably in recent news, has said, we don't do politics. We don't, we stick to sports. This is what it should be. And the culture there, especially if you're gonna be on TV, is very, this is what you look like, this is what you dress like. And like, clearly, I just, I can't do that. <laughs> like, I can't mm -hmm. be my best self as fitting in that box. Can I add something? Absolutely. I feel like you, what you're talking about like, kind of sparked another thought for me that as I think back to being a young reporter was really how to use your, um, how to use your assets to help you as a reporter break stories. Mm -hmm. So I discovered this when I was covering higher education that um, I was covering the UW and I just made an effort to build a relationship with each of the Board of Regents at the University of Washington and it just so happens that the Regents of Color were like, gave me more time and were likely to give me story tips. And so I was actually able to break a national story through those relationships. So it's not, I feel like earlier when you asked me the question, I just talked about the problems with it, but I think it'd be an asset and you shouldn't be afraid to use your cultural relationships or like to be, build a stronger relationship with a female source um, because most likely they have been ignored by white male reporters. 1, I think that's totally true in sports. Yeah, absolutely. I um, covered college basketball as my primary beat at ESPN. And it, it's funny because that is a very white male dominated space in terms of who's reporting on that sport. But the benefit I had, especially in profile writing, is they were closer to my peer group as people who are at the university level as young black men and I was fresh out of college. So there was a little bit more commonality there. But my number one source group became mamas because they'd be like, you're gonna write about my son, I'll drink so cute, let's go. <laughs> they would give me all this background on kids that like you would never know as an adult white guy who's going, well, I'm gonna talk to you about X's and O's and you know what kind of point guard you are. And I'd be like, well, you know, tell me about how he got started in the sport and like what what's the thing that he is too proud to tell me? And they always would. It was hilarious. <laughs> That's really funny. Christy, so 
when you think of TV news, there's probably not a lot of women leading TV stations. What has that been like for you? So I actually have the numbers. Um, so for general managers of television stations, 19% of them are women. Uh, that's the best number I'm about to tell you right now. So 8% of all television general managers are minorities, about 1% black, 1% Asian American, and Hispanics are around 4%. So if you look at like, okay, a Latina leading a TV station, well, there's probably only a handful of us, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And those are numbers that really need to change. 17% um, of news directors and television stations are people of color. And so what does that do to our product? It's actually not good for our business. Uh, it's a threat to our business to have that lack of diversity because we are telling stories in diverse populations. So if you don't really have a diverse leadership team at the table when you're pitching these stories, first of all, your newscast, your news product is not going to be as good as it could be. So that's hugely important. And when you ask me what it's like, um, it's funny because I, I worked for a company who was bold enough to give a young, a young Latina a shot at becoming a general manager. And I also come from the marketing background, which is not a normal place for general managers to come from. They were bold, and they thought I had the kind of skill that would be needed here at the ABC station here in Austin. Um, and so far, so good. But now I get phone calls from recruiters asking me, hey, do you know other people like you who we can put in this general manager job? And um, they don't have the networks. I'm trying to build my own network of women and, and people of color who are ready for those positions. So what it feels like now is that the world is hungry for our leadership. Um, and we need, in this room need to do a better job of stepping up to the table and being bold about our own goals and our own plans and seeing ourselves in those jobs and not holding ourselves back. Like, oh, I don't really, see. no, push yourself forward. Just see how far you can go in your career. Uh, can you go to the top? You know, now my new dream is to be a CEO. It's a pretty good dream. Yeah. I see, we, it looks like we have a question back there. I don't know if it's on, hello, yes. Hi, my name is Liz. Um, I have a question, it kind of goes, I, I was enjoying this whole conversation, but it kind of goes back to something you were talking about earlier about being in meetings and not speaking up, and then you kind of have that moment afterward where you're like, damn, I should have said something, or, um, or, you know, just, re you know, re that regret feeling. And I find, like, I'm pretty young. I'm pretty early career right now. And when you get brought into the meeting that you really wanted to get into, where you're strategizing about something, or you're working with some higher-up editors, and you're the youngest person in the room, maybe the only woman in the room, in, in my case sometimes. I know I experience that. And you have, like, a moment of, like, self-doubt. Um, and you don't trust your own opinions. So I was wondering if you had any tips or tricks I know, like, I've had moments where I've been like, I should have brought up that, you know, in, ex in an election, we should have done this story on the female candidate. And I was the only woman in the room when we were talking about something like this. And maybe that was on, like, I don't know, like, some tips or tricks to kind of, or the big one with me, honestly, is, you know, I'm the youngest person here. Maybe it's time for me to sit back and kind of, like, these, these guys have been doing this for so many years. Um, to like boost your own confidence in that moment and be like, no, I'll speak up, no, I'll do this. And when is it actually appropriate maybe to sit back and like let somebody with a little bit more experience, um, I don't know, like I ha I have, do you have any examples of having to deal with that or any tricks on dealing with that in that, those situations? I think one of my tricks is to have a little bit of a mental scorecard for yourself because you showing up at the meeting is attendance. So did I say something in terms of like contributing to the conversation? Did I add something to the, to the conversation? Did I co-sign one thing or did I shoot down something else? If you didn't check one of those boxes, why are you in, at the meeting? That, that to me is one of the things that like pushes down the self-doubt because you have to have a reason for being in the space. You're not gonna get invited to the next meeting if nobody remembers that you were there. Um, I, when I'm, sometimes you can have meetings with other people, one-on-one -on -one meetings with other people. I, I think sometimes that like when you feel that way, you don't feel confident with the people who are in the room, right? So what can you do outside of that meeting to build confidence in that relationship? 
So when I got promoted into the executive level, you know, there was another VP in there who's an interrupter. He's a dude, and he's an interrupter. And I mean, it actually goes against the culture of our of the Seattle Times, which is actually like a great no asshole culture. Um, there's a great book called The No Asshole Rule. I highly recommend reading it as future leaders of this, of this industry. Um, but he was an interrupter, so I went to the president, who's the moderator and who calls that meeting, and I just said, listen, it's like, I, I don't really like the culture of this meeting. I feel like I'm, we're constantly interrupting each other, not just me, but he's interrupting everyone else in the meeting, and it's creating this reinforcing cycle of everyone interrupting each other to be heard. Can you actually help create a culture where everyone can be heard? And um, that helped build my relationship with him. And then it made me feel more comfortable. And then he said, that's a good point. I'm gonna work on that, right? So then that made me feel like I had space to say something as opposed to like that kind of feeling of when you're playing jump rope, when you're like, just like, okay, I'm gonna jump in. Oh wait, I missed my chance, I'm out. <laughs> Liz, let me ask you something. Who are you serving with your content? Who's your audience? Microphone. microphone. Okay, what Sorry. city? I stepped away so you wouldn't like hear me breathing or something weird. Um, what I work city? at an NPR affiliate, so it's a radio station. Uh -huh. I'm on a digital team, okay, um, which is pretty small within the organization already, and uh -huh. not like trying to like find its own voice in the organization. Um, and then on that team, I guess I'd consider myself like a leader of, of that particular team. I definitely like lead certain efforts. Um, what city is it in? Boston. Okay. So let's think about the demographics of Boston. How many women are there in the city? I think it's majority women. I think it's like, yeah. And, and actually, the majority of our listeners are women. OK. So oh, yeah, okay. stats-wise. Yeah. OK, so <laughs> yeah. let's just take a step back. Maybe in that meeting, you don't think about yourself or whether or not you should speak up, but you think about who you're serving. Right. And if your listeners are majority women, you have a huge business imperative to speak up now. So don't think about you, like get yourself out of the way, but think about the audience you're serving and oh my goodness, do they need to hear your voice, especially if you're the only woman in those meetings. And again, that's why I say use your diversity as a strength because 30% uh, of Austin is Hispanic. I have a responsibility to speak up about cultural issues that I may know about that other people in the room don't know about. And so each one of you has that responsibility. So. Again, that's your strength. You know the audience. You are the audience. They invited you to the meeting for a reason. Thank you. <laughs> your, your question raises another question for me. Is what, what do we do about meetings where there's only one woman there? I mean, how do you, how do you, have you ever had to push back against that and to try and make sure that there are more women included in these meetings? Absolutely. Yeah, 1,000%, or you bring it up in the meeting, because there are times when I, I couch my opinion about something or I couch my feedback in the statement that, well, I feel really uncomfortable being the only person of color here speaking on this issue. This is what I think. And the same thing with being a woman. It's, I'm the only woman in the room. Here's what I think about this, and I think we would be doing a disservice to this group of our readers or our staff by doing X, Y, and Z, but I, I try to remind people that I cannot be the only black person or the only woman whose opinion matters, because we don't get ahead like that. As an organization, we can't do better coverage. We can't increase our audience. We can't be of service to people if there is one view on what it means to be a minority or how decisions will impact the coverage. Um, I mean, I think I brought up one example, which is go to people outside of the meeting, mm -hmm. right, and talk to them about it. Um, I, the, the quote you shared earlier about that I had with my boss, the publisher, about not wanting to be the only woman and person of color and person under 50 at the executive level, um, you know, I, I said that in a one-on-one -on -one meeting with him when he was like, how are things going, right? And I think that gave us a chance to have a conversation, right? And he took it really seriously, like diversity is important to him. He had. He had just overlooked it, and he's like, okay, I'm gonna work on that. Um, so I think kind of having those one-on-one -on -one conversations outside the meeting about what kind of meeting we wanna have and who needs to be there is a good way to deal with that. Um, I will say, like, as you rise into management, one of the things that you can do is just 
call that out in other meetings. Um, as you get moved into management, you're often asked to like nominate people for task forces and committees. And these are actually incredible opportunities for young people, for women, for underrepresented members of your organization to share their leadership. So I think like also like looking to where you can influence other meetings that you're not even in. And finding allies. So I see a lot of allies in this room because there are a lot of men in this room. And I'm assuming you're here because you care about these issues as well. And so that means a lot to me of all of the men who have helped me in my career too and see value in diversity. And so I honor you guys who are here who care about it and just say, like, we need all the help we can get, right? So you guys are our partners in that and can ally and, and stand with us. And so, um, you know, have those conversations with your staff or with your coworkers and, like, let's band together to help our rooms, these meetings, all of them be more diverse and be more, have gender parity at every level where we can because that will make all of our businesses make more money. End of story. I see we've got a couple more questions back there. Uh, right here. Yeah, um, actually mine fits in well with the ally discussion. I'm wondering how can you effectively address when someone who is purporting to be an ally sort of has their ally blinders on and doesn't realize they're doing damage to the movement in some way? And how can you work to address your own blinders as an ally? That's a hard one because I, I, I do think that is one of the values of the one-on-one -on -one meeting because nobody likes to be called out on that kind of blindness in a public space because immediately the defense mechanisms go up and it's like it's just a bad conversation. Mm -hmm. So I would say one-on-one -on -one, trying to pull people aside, but it, I think it's a really, really relevant question as we talk about a seat at the table and knowing that a seat for women at the table is sometimes shaped inadvertently in a lot of ways by the fact that white women sort of benefit from increased opportunities from minorities at different rates than women of color. And so speaking up in a meeting where someone has some blinders up and is potentially a white woman feels like you are taking a knife to another woman. And so sometimes it doesn't happen, but there does need to be that conversation if those seats are gonna continue to be opened up and if everybody is gonna have a true seat at the table. And I think it goes with regard to color lines, but also um, inclusion of trans women as well. Yeah, I, that one-on-one -on -one is key. You know, having that, and it can be a good conversation. What was the specific behavior that happened? What was the impact? And that's what you need to tell them. You never want to name call somebody, and especially if somebody sees themselves as an ally, that's actually something you can use and help grow, you know, hey, you did this, you said this on Thursday, it made me feel this way. Um, and they'll probably be like, oh, oh my goodness, I had no idea I was doing that. And I, that's happened to me, y'all, because when I moved to the South, I didn't know that there were certain words and verbs that I couldn't use, just because I'm coming from the West where we didn't have a lexicon around some of the history that has happened in the South. And so I made, I used a, a verb once that, Thankfully, I had another um, minority female pull me aside and say, hey, you used this in a meeting today, and this is how I perceived it. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, because here I am, like, I think I'm a, a proponent for diversity, and I'm using language that was offensive. And I was so grateful that she pulled me aside and did that. So I think it's a gift that we give each other, um, especially when you view yourself as an ally. Yes, feedback is definitely a gift. You yeah, can choose it really to is. accept it or reject it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I really like what you said just about framing it as intent and effect, right? When you're calling someone out, A, do it one on one, but B, like really being like, I recognize that this is a place of intent, intent that you're coming from, and this is the effect it had. So, like, that's just a really important framework when talking to people about these situations. So you're not like, you're being homophobic, right? It's yeah. like, I recognize your intention was to do this. The effect was this. Thank you. Neeti. Hi, my name is Neeti. Um, I'm sorry, I came a little late, so forgive me if um, you've already addressed this. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the balance between um, siloed diversity in, in organizations. So there's teams that are maybe working specifically on issues through a lens of race mm -hmm. and uh, it's 
that's wonderful, but when the rest of the newsroom is able to point to that and say, oh no, we have it handled, we had this little team over there that's doing their thing, but they get no promotion on the homepage, don't even, you know, like it's, it feels very separate and othering and doesn't get the same resources. And obviously I have a lot of feelings about that. But then on the flip side, it's my favorite place to be because it's a room of only people of color who can really like talk about stuff very openly. So it's like, I, I realized recently that there was a balance there, that, that I felt like there was some value that it was a safe space, but also that clearly we're being put in a corner. Wow. So if you have any thoughts. <laughs> Wait until your safe space becomes a whole newsroom. Because in a truly diverse newsroom, um, it is a safe place when there's so much at that. It is so, it's the coolest thing. And the silos bother me. And I see it a lot in the uh, Hispanic culture because so many Latinas I know will like go work for Spanish language media. Mm -hmm. And they're comfortable there. And then we're missing out on all this talent on the general market side. My whole career has been in general market, not on purpose, but that's just where I landed. And I, it, I almost want to recruit more people over away from that because we need that diversity on the gen market side. And imagine if that newsroom, the whole newsroom is your safe space where everybody feels free to have those conversations. It is the coolest thing and I've seen it in a few newsrooms. It's amazing. What's the safe space you're talking about? Is it like the immigration and diversity beat coverage team or is it like a diversity task force um, or something else? It's a newsletter that's focused on race. <clears throat> okay. So it's like off platform and uh, definitely like, I, obviously I would love to be in a newsroom where yeah. you feel like everybody's on the same page, but if that's not the case, like yeah. how do we move the conversation forward? Because I feel like a lot of us are tired of just talking about how we need more diversity when you don't feel like the rest of the newsroom is on board, like what can we actually do to try to move get it into out management, of that? get into <laughs> management and change it? <laughs> well, I think also connect the dots for people um, because if that is showing audience growth and audience success, then we ought to be able to connect it to how it's part of your brand's mission or your newsroom's growth potential. So like, this is a thing that our audience cares about we should make it a bigger part of our focus every day. Um, I think also maybe pitching some of those stories for promotion on specific desks or specific drop downs. Um, connect the dots for your editors and say, yes, this newsletter is focused on race, but this story is an immigration story, which is a huge political moment right now. Why isn't it here? Mm -hmm. And so connect it to some of the other beats that exist that do get promoted. So people can understand, oh, it shouldn't live on an island. Is there like a separate kind of group that does talk about diversity, like just in the workplace in your newsroom? I think so. <laughs> um, I'm not really sure. I think that I'm sure there's some like diversity initiatives, but not. Yeah, I mean, that. if you feel like your newsletter team is the only place talking about diversity in the department that you work in, there actually does need to be a group talking about diversity in your newsroom, period, right? Like, what is diversifying coverage on other beats look like, or in other newsletters, or what's the diversity strategy around recruitment and retention? Like, there, there needs to be both. It's not just a topic, like a content vertical. Right. Um, so I would encourage, like, to just talk through leadership with your, you know, department boss about that. Because like, I think it's, that's actually the way to connect these issues to other people in your organization um, of all backgrounds. Great, thank you, it's really helpful. I'd like to circle back a little bit to something that uh, Christy mentioned, sort of this idea of lifting others up. And uh, by now probably everyone has heard about the, the strategy that the women in the Obama administration developed to amplify each other's voices where when they were in meetings together and one presented an idea, another would echo that idea with credit for that woman and, and they found that that was just a really necessary strategy or the, the first woman's ideas just kind of fell away and no one paid attention. Have you guys cultivated any, any tools or, or strategies like that that, that help to get your voice out there as, as well as the other women in the organization? I mean, I feel like I have a tacit understanding with the other woman VP <laughs> that 
<laughs> that were like, if like she's getting talked over, then I come in and try to reinforce it in some way mm -hmm. and vice versa. I mean, you don't want to seem like a pact either, right. right? Like I don't agree with her about everything 100%. I can come in and be like, I don't necessarily agree with this perspective, but I hear what you're saying about blah. So um, that's where we've used it. But it's always been slightly tacit. Mm -hmm. I'd say that I'd try to make sure that, especially as we're having project meetings or assignment meetings, that there is enough room so that women involved feel like they can delegate. Uh, I, I think it's important that in meetings that you don't get looked down on for saying, hey, I need somebody to take notes in this meeting, or I need someone else on the team to be responsible for keeping the deadlines, because it allows women to grow into leadership roles, not being so focused on being the task minder of a project. I would like for the women to have empowerment and the agency to really think creatively about what we need next. And I, I, I think that sort of starts at the top to say, hey, if you need you know, two or three hours away from your core job to say, I wanna expand into this area, that's fine. And to say that publicly in front of some of the other editors or some of the other people on the team, I think should hopefully help people grow into different roles beyond just saying, I gotta do everything and this. Mm -hmm. Because we know that women tend not to ask for extra help or extra resources because we feel like it'll get us looked down upon or it is a knock against our competency. And what I want people to know is, no it is not. Put that meeting schedule, you don't have to be the meeting setter upper person. Please don't be the person bringing in cupcakes. The thing I need from you is this. That's good. Speaking up, which I like to do because that's just my personality, is it's opened up doors for me. Um, but I try to be very careful about when I do speak up because I always want to add value to the meeting or the circumstance. And of course, not just talk for the sake of hearing my own voice, I hope. Um, but so I bring a lot of data, you know, and some of the teams that I've had to work the hardest to win over, like in New York, where they, you know, everybody thinks they know it all because they're at the top of the top um, in, a, in a TV newsroom. Uh, when you bring value or you bring a differing perspective that people didn't think of, it's usually you get that, oh, that's, and then that starts to open doors where people who normally wouldn't seek you out start to because they know that you're going to offer some sort of data point or value that they hadn't thought of. Sure. See, we've got another question back there. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you had any tips for recruiting talent of color. I was hiring for the first time earlier this year, and I was staffing a TV show, and so I was hiring like 23 people in the space of a month, and wow. we posted the jobs, and going through the applicants, just the vast, vast, vast majority were white, and mm. partly because I wasn't experienced doing hiring, and I was in a huge time crunch, I was just like, I don't have the time to do what, I, I wish I had some strategies for how to recruit a more diverse applicant pool. Yeah, and those networks that you build ahead of time are really key, so it, it, and that's what happens. Um, you know, you're in a time crunch or whatever, you just take what comes in. Uh, that's a difficult way to build a diverse team. So I know I spend a lot of time with NAHJ, um, spend time with NABJ and just different organizations so that you do have those diverse networks. I'm on LinkedIn constantly. I will tell you that if I post a job on LinkedIn, men, bravo, because nine out of 10 people who talk to me about jobs on LinkedIn are men. The women are, I don't know what's wrong with us, but we're not realizing the potential of that platform for job growth. Um, so it, this is not a good answer for you because it's really building up that diverse network before you get into that position where you're gonna be bringing on a big team or at least knowing people who head those organizations who can help you and give you resources. Yeah, it's a, I think the onus will be on hiring managers to be very proactive about where they list. Because you're right, like LinkedIn is one thing and depending on your website or your organization, you might have like a job section on your website. But we know that women in particular will not apply for those jobs unless they check all the boxes for the requirements, whereas men will apply for the job if they meet three of the requirements. And so really getting those listings out 
outside of the normal networks, outside of saying, well, I put it here and I waited for people to apply to it. You have to sort of circulate those job listings, even if it's emailing out to people that you know and then holding yourself accountable for getting through screenings and saying, I'm not moving on to the next round of screenings unless I have a candidate base that looks like this. Um, yeah, I mean, have you heard of the Rooney Rule? Okay, well, why don't you stop? <laughs> You're the sports person here. What's you brought Rooney it up. Rule? <laughs> okay, Rooney Rule was um, the owner of the Oakland Raiders. Basically, they wanted to get more diversity in management mm -hmm. of, the, of the Raiders, and they basically said, um, whenever we have a finalist pool for a job in like the football management side, the front office side, at least one person has to be in like an underrepresented person, like a woman or a person of color. So I think as a boss, you can just say that, right? Like I basically say this is what's going to be true of the hires that I make. And then I tell the managers that work for me, this is the rule for you as well. Do not come to me with three like three candidates that are exactly the same because we're not going to move forward with a job decision and that actually forces you then you have to get creative and figure it out right like then like strangely enough you're able to like that now i'm like oh if i'm not f moving forward i better start working my email network or linkedin or reaching out to people i know um i will say don shelton he's the executive editor of the seattle times when he was sports editor i just like kind of marveled at the diversity of his team and one time i asked him I was like, how did you get a Asian American LGBT football, college football writer? How is it that you have an African American columnist? How is it that, um, and he basically said, he just like, he mentors college students. He's always thinking about that pipeline. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, that person I hired, I actually met her six years ago at the, through this college class and we stayed in touch over time, right? So every person that he's brought in, he identified like four years earlier, which doesn't, wouldn't have helped you in that moment, but that's really hard to do to set time aside for that when you're like, oh, I gotta get this show out or I'm meeting this deadline. But you kind of, it's like a systems level action, right? Like that very slowly the impact of that unfolds over time. So like going to NAHJ, right? Like in the moment, I don't have a job opening, but that relationship can lead to a hire three years down the line. Yeah, and I have to, I, as a president and general manager, I have to set aside time for recruiting each week. So I mentor, I have at least two phone calls. I'm on LinkedIn all the time. There's also some really great Facebook groups. Like, does anyone still use a diverse editor, social media editors one? I'm in that one. Then there's a good Latinas one. There's a, there's a few of them out there that, again, I'm just active in posting so that when that does happen, you know, I've, it's already built and ready to go. Is Sharif, is that you? Okay, so Sharif, wave, wave your hand. Sharif is the president of the National um, Lesbian Gay Journalist Association, right? Like, when you have a job opening, when, whenever I have a job opening, Sharif, like, posts it on the NLGJA and, like, likes it, shares it, right? So, like, there's one person that I would recommend, like, getting to know and getting his email address and connecting with on Facebook. Great, thank you. Is there another question here? No, oh, no, don't take this one. <laughs> Uh, so kind of to follow that up, uh, my, my question with this is that we talk a lot about obviously lifting people up and, and you know, this, this recruiting and, and making sure that our newsrooms are diverse, but the one thing that Elena brought up is retention. And a lot of the times, just only speaking as a black journalist, a lot of times we, we're not, we're, we aren't able to stay in newsrooms because we don't feel valued in our newsrooms. Once you get people past the hire, how do you keep them there? What are the things that uh, are making them either work harder or making them enjoy their work and how do you kind of at least, at least make, make them feel valued in their newsrooms. Like, how do you go beyond just, okay, you're here, okay, we're doing the recruitment, but now I want you to stay here. I want you to be a valued member of our newsroom. Oh, I said don't take his question because he works for the SB Nation. <laughs> okay, That's our got staff, it. staff writer, Tyler Johns. Um, I, I'll address it because I think he's an example of this, but I mean, you can't have barriers to people being themselves if you mm. brought people in thinking that I would like a diverse staff and I, I would like this to be more representative of our audience and I would like to attract new and different audience. You can't bring people in and give them inhibitors to being themselves. So I think that that's one big thing. But also, it's very hard to create a diverse newsroom through strictly hiring because headcounts are hard to come by. 
general, journalism yeah. budgets are not yeah. huge and massive like they have been in the past. And so you have to create some mobility for people uh, and look out for spots where you can give people areas of opportunity either to own a beat or to shape their beat or to manage people because that's the only way to contribute to organize around true sustained diversity to make sure that people have like an upward mobility within your newsroom. Yeah, it, I mean like, yeah. it's, go ahead. Oh, it, it is hard, right? But um, my biggest strategy for helping that is actually just that one-on-one, -on -one. like I've learned that as a boss, my job is to truly care about somebody and to find out what you wanna do with your life. So if I'm being a good manager, I know on my team like what drives them because we're not all driven by the same things. I want to be a CEO. That's a crazy thing to want to be, but like, no, <laughs> thank you. It's just a lot of work. That's what I'm <laughs> alluding to. But um, you know, you may want to be an EP one day, right? So I need to know that about you. And then if you you need to have a manager that cares enough about you to find out your goals and will shepherd you along the way. So really be in a place that has a culture of succession planning and bosses that care enough to find out what drives you, where you want to end up. And if they haven't asked you, be like, hey, I need 15 minutes to sit with you because I want to talk about my future, right? And then it's on them. Like, if they're going to be a good, a good leader of you, it's their responsibility to bring you along. And like KVU, we're market 39. So I'm going to expect that people are going to come and leave. I, because we're a mid-level market and our salaries aren't ginormous like they are in top 10 markets, my job is to make sure they are better for having spent time in our newsroom. And they leave and make us look good. So again, it's finding that culture as well and making sure, like, even if your leaders aren't doing it, maybe you should just teach them how to do it. Be like, this is what I want to do. <laughs> um, I think that last point is really important. What is the story that you're telling your bosses about yourself? Because actually, they want to keep you if you are a good performer, right? If you're delivering and showing results, like Elena said earlier, they actually will want to keep you. But absent of a story you tell them about what you want to be, they don't know or they make it up and it's not actually what you want to do. So, and oftentimes like we are racked with like, I don't know what I want to be, do I want to, I mean, she's very clear on what she wants to be. But like, you know, when I was like a futures reporter writing about hiking in the Northwest, I didn't know what I wanted to be. So the bosses just didn't really know what to do with me. And it wasn't until I said, I want to move to this position next. Like, I wasn't even like, this is my dream job five years down the line, this is the job I want next. Then they're like, okay, we can help you do that. Um, but I will say part of what I see with young journals of color that hurt their retention and why they leave is, first of all, um, is a separate, totally separate reason, which has nothing, not that much to do with you, the young person, but you're not getting honest feedback and coaching hmm. from your bosses. Like, for whatever reason, like, because they have a different background, or they are more likely to share honest feedback with people they feel like, I think, feel like understand them. Right, and, and so I, I think that's like a bigger issue in newsrooms, like they're not, like if you have people of different backgrounds and bosses, like they're not getting honest feedback. And I've found that now that I've left the newsroom and I can see this happening in this other department, like sometimes I will meet with journalists of color, I'm like, here's some honest feedback that I'm yeah. seeing and they don't want to hear it from me, I don't work in the newsroom and no one from the newsroom is telling them that. So I think that's like, that does not help you, but building that relationship and saying what you want at least gives that opening for your boss to say, if you want to move to this, you need to do A, B, and C. I would add to that for managers in the room. I don't think all departures are bad, but you have a newsroom problem if the young minority reporters or the young women reporters are leaving for horizontal jobs. If you are preparing people for the next step and they're constantly leaving for bigger markets or bigger opportunities, you probably have a good problem. It's okay, it's yeah. sad when people leave, but like that's a good path. If you ha are losing or have a high turnover rate over a certain group of people and they're not leaving for better jobs, then that's a really significant issue. Uh, over here, you've been waiting for a while. Me? Yeah. Hi. Me. Well, I wanted to know, have any of you ever experienced gender wage discrimination or seen it like in your oh. newsrooms and what yes. are you doing to change it maybe since you're now a GM? Yeah. So every time I've led a department, um, I've got, I've inherited <laughs> salaries 
And in every single case, I'm like, what is going on here? Why does the female on the team make 20 grand less? Okay, sure, she's five years younger, but that, is that really a good enough reason? Um, and that's been in every single operation when it's handed to me. And so on every single team I've been on, I'm like, the first thing I gotta do, bring that parity on. But I would never have that power unless I was running the department or the operation. But I'm telling you, there's so much work to be done and you probably don't make as much as your male counterparts. I learned that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't, I mean like I suspect I've made less than men. Um, we have a great HR department um, at the Seattle Times that actually does, like I've seen the work they're doing to see, look at wage disparity. And so I feel confident in our own company now that I know that. But um, I guess, like, actually, that's worth asking your HR department, right? Like, it's kind of uncomfortable to ask your boss, am I getting paid less than men who are making the, doing the same job? But you can actually, like, I, I don't think that's an out, like, a crazy question to ask your HR department. Like, what work do we do to make sure there's, there aren't, like, large gender wage disparities in the company? And hopefully they have an answer. If they don't, now you've kind of raised it as an issue. I'm gonna jump ahead to the next question here. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, Elena, I loved what you said about uh, not needing to be liked as much as being right, like being right, not always needing to be liked. This is something that I really struggle with. I'm sure a lot of other women do as well. Um, when we're in spaces that we're surrounded by mostly men or we don't have a whole lot of allies in the room, I'm wondering how have you throughout your careers mitigated this need um, that sometimes inevitably comes when you're in a situation where you don't have a whole lot of allies and you feel like something is wrong or you want to confront an issue, but you're battling being junior and wanting to still come off respectful and you want to be liked. Yeah, I, nobody doesn't want to be liked. <laughs> so like that's a, it's a really good question because you have to sort of make some judgment calls within yourself about where your self-worth comes from. And if it's solely from being like, then you're always gonna have an issue. I think that one of the ways that being in a minority and being a woman in certain rooms has helped me is in the idea that I am never going to fully speak or look or think like everybody else in the room. Like, I, it's a thing I, I can't do. I don't have the same perspective. So again, getting back to that point about speaking up, you have to be yourself and if you can't say those things in those rooms then like they're not liking you for you does that make sense it's like you're, they're liking you because you mimicked what they said and that is a disservice to everybody so it's like sure you're liked but you're liked in quotation marks because they liked you because you tamped yourself down they don't like you mm -hmm. i just spoke up in a room um i'll be generic about it as much as i can but uh, everybody is much older, there are very few females, and um, they're very powerful people, right? But I'm like, this is what it goes through my head, I'm like, they opened the door for me to be in this incredible room right now, so they're gonna get it. <laughs> but you know, they let me in, right? So there's a reason they let me in, and again, I have a responsibility, and my perspective was very different from everyone in the room, and, and contentious. And I know by speaking up and saying it, I'm not gonna be liked, but maybe it's gonna bring value because what I was speaking of, and again, so I didn't, when I gave my feedback in front of this room of very powerful others, um, I didn't say as you guys are being this, or this is, I said these are my observations and I think this might be happening and this is a possible solution of this is another direction we could treat this problem that we're having. And again, trying to deliver in a way that brings value versus like, you guys are wrong, I'm right. And if they listen, great. If not, my year will be over in this room. And, um, or the best case scenario is they're thankful to have an alternative voice in the room. And afterwards, even though it felt like, you know, I was nervous about speaking up, a few people were like, oh, thank God you said that. <laughs> I've been saying that for a long time. Um, but even if that didn't happen, 
I like to get comfortable in that rejection because it just makes me feel stronger at the end of the day. I'm like, just reject me more and more because like that you're just adding to the chips on my shoulder and it's gonna make me stronger at the end of the day. Um, I actually think when you're younger and you're like one, like a, just, I, I think part of the issue is like building relationships of trust, right? And feeling like you're part of the crowd um, and that you actually do have to do a certain amount of legwork on that when you're young. You gotta show up at the happy hour, right? You gotta show up at lunch when the whole team is going to lunch. And like, and those bonds are actually super important to building working relationships of trust. They seem superficial. I have a guy on my team who never shows up at the team lunch. He and I are going to have to have a talk at some point because he wants to move into management. So I think like if, um, really like I'm sorry this is a part of your job and like a part of like being a leader so um, I think there's that part about being that I think speaks to like are you building those relationships of trust simply by socializing with them like I think that that was like really hard for me as an Asian person right I show up I do my job I'm turning in my story on time it's like you know, all the spelling and grammar, and like it's all AP style, so what else do I need to do here, right? But actually, I did need to show up at happy hour, and I did need to go to this whatever thing that, you know, that was gonna be the social event of, of the month with the newsroom. So I would like, you know, I, I mean, I think like that's part of it to build the relationships of trust, but um, at the end of it, it goes back to what you were saying. What is your goal for what you're about to say? Right, like she's talking about representing the community and building a stronger um, news station that reaches those committee, uh, communities over the other stations in mm -hmm. Austin, right? Like you just have to think back to when you're in that moment of saying something that's contrarian, what is the goal? Thank you. I really hate to cut this conversation off. I, I'm sure there are more questions, but I think we have already overstayed our welcome here. And um, so just a couple things b before we go. Um, one is just sort of looking around this room. We we've talked about how important networks are. And right here, we have a sub network. Um, so I'd love if, if people want to, when you fill out your feedback uh, on the app, on the guidebook app, if you submit your email address with your feedback and you want to join in, we can kind of pool that all together and try and make a network where we can, can talk with each other and you can continue this conversation. But I encourage you to continue it in your newsrooms and uh, with others that you meet at the conference and keep finding more networks to, to join so that you can build your own path. Uh, I also wanna say that uh, I need to give a quick shout out to Lara Satrakian who was very much looking forward to being here but unfortunately was not able to due to a family emergency. But I hope that you'll all join me in a warm thank you for Christy and Sharon and Elena for joining us. Uh, this has been really great. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you, you guys. Friend me on LinkedIn. <laughs>